Okay, I've uh, spoken about the subject before, but it's a sort of thing always worth, um, let's say, extension videos or um, additional videos because it's something that really um, does have a lot of talking points. In my opinion, isn't as black and white as uh, some people would imply it is, and that's uh, the subject of pacifism. Um, let me just say from the outset, um, just so you know where I lie, you know, full disclaimer, I'm not a pacifist. Um, there was a period around 2003 when I actively opposed the Iraq war. I say actively because I took part in protests. Um, where I definitely was interested in the idea of pacifism. Um, but I think it was never really in me, that full philosophy of pacifism. It was never, it's not that I uh, like violence, but I just felt then, and I feel now, that ultimately it's a utopian concept that can never really fully work. Um, Certainly not among, what is it, close to 8 billion people now in the world. Not among everyone. I mean, it's, um, what may be interesting is you could find a situation where the number of armed conflicts are decreased. And actually, um, an optimistic thing to consider is that by what people may perceive, the world is actually more peaceful than it was several decades ago. I mean, in de facto terms, I'm not talking about uh, potential of conflict. There's always potential. I mean, we've seen that with the clashes between India and China recently um, and the standoff between Iran and the United States earlier in the year. So there's always a potential for armed conflict. But um, uh, Stephen Pinker put forward the theory that we're actually... Um, and I haven't looked in depth into his work, but I, I understand his theory is that uh, we're actually living in one of the most peaceful times in human history. If you look at some of the atrocities and wars that have occurred throughout human history, um, you look at the worst ones, they're almost all in, in the past. Well, they're all in the past. They're all in the, with the exception of World War Two and World War One. some of the worst, bloodiest Conflicts in human history have been, um, you know, in the distant past. For example, the An Lushan Rebellion in China may have cost as many as 36 million lives. This was under the Tang Dynasty in the 8th century. Um, so it's important to actually think about things like this in context. Very important. It's a little bit like the perception of crime, you know. That is to say, the perception of crime is probably higher than actual crime rates, in the UK at least. Um, even if we look at relatively modern history, um, look at the sort of number of armed conflicts that were going on in the 1970s, or even the 1990s, I would say the 90s was far worse than now. Um, of course there's conflict zones in the world today. There is, um, the Syria war is still festering on. Libya remains very volatile, um, and countries like Somalia and Iraq and certainly Afghanistan are um, still very far from peace. Uh, Yemen, you know, is a humanitarian crisis, uh, and there's many other examples. But if you actually look at the number of armed conflicts in the world today, it has decreased from the 1970s or even the 1990s significantly. And the number of people who are dying in armed conflicts has also decreased. Now, a statement like that will never be reassuring to those who are living in the middle of the hill. You know, I could never say something like that to someone who's in Aleppo or Sana'a because that's not their reality or Kabul, you know. But many very bloody armed conflicts um, you know, that seem to have no end in sight now seem like a distant memory. For example, uh, American Vietnamese War. I could say the Vietnam War, but it's known as the American War in Vietnam. But the Vietnam War, you know, it's um, now Vietnam's a fast growing economy. It's generally pretty good relations with the United States. Um, and it's not perfect. It's an authoritarian communist state. 
but it is at peace. And so the memories of that terrible conflict seem distant now. Um, although the legacy is still there, you know, occasionally they find landmines and so on. But I think it's very, very important that people understand this because when people say think that what's the world coming to, that suggests to me that they're not really, they haven't really done their homework on what the situation actually is compared to the past. And it's extremely important, in my opinion, to look at that in context. Anyway, um, I've been watching and pulling an all night here, as you can see. Sorting out my newspapers. Um, I've been watching the bed in, the famous bed in by John Lennon and Yoko Ono at the hotel in um, Montreal. I forget the name of the hotel now, but it was their famous kind of um, event. For want of a better term, they they themselves said it was sort of a a, a sale a sales pitch. Um, it was a gimmick, as Yoko Ono said. Um, I've been watching documentary on that, and it's it's edited, but it, it's showing a lot of the main gist of the event. It's about an hour and ten minutes long, um, and it's very interesting viewing. I was aware of the event, but I, I've never really I've never seen this documentary before. So during that, those seven days in Montreal, apparently they were originally going to do this in the Bahamas. It was too hot. They also done a bed in in Amsterdam, but I think the Montreal one was the most famous one at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel in Montreal. Um, and this was in uh, the summer of 1969, I believe May 1969. So during that period, they had visitors including Timothy Leary, Tommy Smothers, Dick Gregory, Murray the K, Al Cap famously, who was quite confrontational, and uh, Alan Ginsberg, among others. Um, many of the visitors, and I believe they were chosen by the Lenins, but many of the visitors were um, definitely of the same political ideology as the Lenins, certainly well to the left, with the exception of Al Cap. Um, and, you know, it's just interesting seeing the commentary, whether you agree with it or not. It's in an interesting historic archive. I mean, 51 years ago now, so, you know, it's quite a quite a way back. 1969, of course, the uh, war was very much raging in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in, uh, in Biafra. Uh, those three come to mind. Um, the Middle East was always volatile. Um... So, you know, there was obviously a cause there. And much like today, there were uh, social protests in the United States. There was real racial tensions. So, you know, there are some echoes today of some of the things that are going on. Um, what's interesting about the Lennons, now, just as a disclaimer here, I am a huge fan of John Lennon, musically speaking. I think he's maybe the greatest musician of the 20th century, possibly. Um, certainly in the conversation for that, you know, uh, um, no question about that. And I've always been interested in the Lennon-Ono relationship. I know hardcore Beatles fans sort of see her as the devil woman, but uh, I I find the whole dynamic very interesting. Maybe because I'm a white guy who's had a relationship with an Asian woman. I don't know if that's the reason or not. But, you know, what's interesting about it is, anyway, what I was going to say is that's what I think of Lennon as a musician. As a person, he had his flaws. Um, you know, he was a lousy father. Um, he he definitely had his flaws, um, as everyone does. As did Muhammad Ali, as did Malcolm X, as did, as did the other iconic figures of that time. Um, but one thing about the Lennons, to their credit, they were consistent in the pacifist message. So I want to talk a little bit about their message and then about my thoughts on a wider subject. They, they were consistent because they never, unlike some regressive leftists today, they didn't, from what I could see, ever condone violence if it came from the left. They said that was stupid and it was idiotic and it was playing the game of the establishment, as they would put it. Um, so they were consistent in their pacifist message, and they, you know, that's that's important to note. Um, so there was a group of, I guess, some sort of rebels. I don't know uh, who they were exactly, but they were saying they're 
thing was to overthrow the government. It, you know, there was no captions that didn't say who they were. But Lenin and Oko said that's that's stupid. That's you know, don't do that. Um, so they were consistent, and Lenin was always very clear in his opposition to violence. Now, this contrasts other so-called pacifists, or at least figures on the left. One that comes to mind is Jeremy Corbyn, who would be very, you know, tick all the right boxes when it came to denouncing um, right-wing violence, or let's say militarism coming from the United States and the United Kingdom. Yet Corbyn, you know, really, really had a questionable position when it came to Russian militarism, and definitely when it came to Assad brutality in Syria. Indeed, Jeremy Corbyn chaired the Stop the War Coalition for years, an organisation that, in my opinion, is not the pacifist group that it claims. Um, I'm very, very sceptical of the Stop the War Coalition. I think they're a bunch of hypocrites, or at least they are not entirely honest about their agenda. They say it's all about pacifism. I believe it's all about an anti-West agenda. It's not a consistent pacifist message. If it was, they would be a lot more vocal in their condemnation of Assad. You know, a brutal dictator who rained barrel bombs on men, women and children. Um, so that would be a contrast, perhaps. Um, I know of left-wing people who will always pontificate about peace. Um, and yet they praised Fidel Castro when he died. You know, a man who used torture and repression to put down dissent. Um, so there is a rather nauseating hypocrisy from from some on the left. And to be fair to the Lenins, I don't think they fully, um, I don't think they exhibited that. Now, maybe John Lennon and Yoko Ono were too quiet about the sort of, um, I mean, 1969 we're talking about, this was the height of the Cultural Revolution in China. Um... I think it's perhaps unreasonable to expect people to be everywhere at once, and I think the Lenin's message was consistent. Now, I get to the point about pacifism itself as a concept. Um, the interesting thing about the bedding actually was it was not that revolutionary. I don't mean the idea, but I mean their message was quite him. They were actually saying, you know, slow everything down. This is a gimmick. Just, uh, I mean, their message was serious, but they admitted that the method was meant to not be taken, you know, that was just the, that they were, the message I took from that is that's irrelevant, you know, the bed-in factor, it's just practical, as opposed to, you know, if it gets attention, then so be it. And to be fair, it did get attention, you know, it done what it set out to do in that sense. In fact, there was one man who walked all the way from Toronto to Montreal uh, because he was so inspired by this. And unquestionably, it's played a big part in popular culture. It's one of those defining images of certainly of the year 1969. But the concept of pacifism, this is where um, I think it becomes very murky and where I think the sort of black and white mentality that the Lenins had was just naive. Um, you know... It's often said that it's politicians and those who are pro-war and ever prepared to do it themselves. Sometimes they are actually as a matter of record. But, you know, you could also make that argument to pacifist preaching. What I mean by that is, and this was actually one criticism of Gandhi, pacifists will say violence is all always wrong. It's always bad. No matter what the circumstances, it never achieves anything. So the pacifist position on self-defense becomes very murky, very murky, um, because you get a situation where a man, let's say, has a home intruder, and that home intruder wants to rape his wife and kill his children. Can the pacifist argument really, really rationally reconcile with that sort of situation i would argue it just can't and i would argue that it actually becomes a moral problem when a man in that situation would say no i'm a pacifist i'm just going to let the assailant do this it's not good enough to say oh well let's just sit down and talk about it 
because you know they're not interested in that they just want your money they want whatever it is that's fueled them to do that whether it be drugs or a hate crime or whatever it is so this is always the problem i've had with the pacifist approach or the, rather the pacifist philosophy it really has no answer for that it really really doesn't and actually um lecturing others to be pacifist and to be fair the lenin said that they weren't lecturing people that was their method and they were just trying to inspire people but there are other pacifists who you know an interesting thing actually about the bedin was that al cap was clearly trying to goad lenin ostensibly into i wonder was he hoping to you know get lenin to swing out at him to show what hypocrite he was and you could tell lenin was getting annoyed and he was known for having a bad temper so this guy al cap i didn't know who he was i googled it apparently he was a cartoonist um and right wing risk commentator it was an interesting viewing uh you know you could tell he was trying to get under their skin and on some level it was working on some level i mean it would have been absolutely i guess from his point of view pr gold if lenin lost his temper and just lashed out because then he could have said oh look you're a hypocrite um but in the real world in the real world you know a lot of people simply don't have the luxury of being pacifist because it's um you know if you take for example the situation in in syria take for example um the ypg the kurdish defense forces who fought against islamic state many of them women now can anyone rationally say that they had no moral right to fight back using force using violence against isis can anyone rationally say that those women uh, and men you know should have just sat down with isis and work through their differences i think that is irrational and i think the problem with the pacifist message is it totally totally misunderstands or underestimates the power of fanaticism with a deaf cult like isis you can't reason with isis you can't like the best hope when it comes to islamic extremism or any extremism for that matter is you know early stage prevention but when you get to the point of people who are putting men in cages and drowning them or selling women as sex slaves or throwing gay men off buildings I just think, or getting children to strap explosives from themselves, I think it's a height of naivety to to have any sort of pacifist argument that that can be negotiated with. And actually, even if it could be negotiated with, even if you say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna sit down and we'll have peace. Well, what's the price? Is it just peace? No, it could very well mean. In the case of the Taliban in Afghanistan, it could very well mean enslaving people back to their ideology. I think in the case of Afghanistan, the only hope for an outcome or the only hope for any semblance of peace and stability in that country is some sort of power sharing. Where I would stop short is allowing a situation where the Taliban ever had the sort of power that they had between 1996 and 2001. Um, but I think pure pacifism, it's, it's a lovely idea, but it's just not reality. It's just not. And those who, dare I say, those who push this narrative, I respect where they're coming from, but I also think they've never really been in a position. I mean, John Lennon and Yoko Ono never had to his life and death situations i mean obviously he died tragically he was murdered but in their real life other than the paparazzi they never really had faced physical violence they never had the sort of extreme life and death choices that many others have who take up arms so 
I think the most that we can hope for is reducing armed conflict between nation states. I do think that diplomacy is a powerful thing. I do think that that's something that can happen. But even, I mean, conflict, you know, takes many forms. Conflict can be to a couple having a row. Conflict can be two neighbours knocking the hell out of each other because they've had a dispute over their garden. Conflict can be, it takes many forms. Um, so even even if armed conflict was to end, like war ended, as we know it, there would still be murders, there would still be fisticuffs, there would still be all of that. So I'm afraid it's it's not it's not an optimistic conclusion, but it is a realistic conclusion. And actually, the the pure pacifist message can even be reckless. I mean, one thing that Gandhi was criticised for was telling, on the Salt March in 1931, telling, in some cases, elderly people to just go ahead, and they got beat by truncheon by the British forces. Um, so, you know, leaders who advocate pacifism, whether it be Gandhi or Martin Luther King or, or the Lenins, um, I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? All three ended up dead. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, John Lennon. They all ended up assassinated. And I'm not saying that's because they were pacifists. But it just it's a cruel irony of their lives. That they preach peace and yet their five and deaths just showed that how elusive it is. So I think the most you can hope for is um, a relative peace. And I think that on the more optimistic note, the world is actually a lot more peaceful than it was um, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, the number of people dying in armed conflict is significantly less than in the 1970s, if you actually do some research into it, as I have, um, even from the 1990s. I mean, the 90s was a very bloody decade when you had the Rwanda genocide, you had um, the first Chechen war, you had the breakup of Yugoslavia, the Liberian Civil War, the Sierra Leone Civil War, this goes on and on and on. And yeah, there's conflicts today, but I I honestly think even, interestingly, the coronavirus may have slowed down armed conflict, which is a good thing. I mean, the evidence is, you know, to be debated on that, but... Um, I honestly, honestly think that pacifism among 8 billion people you know, 40 years on from John Lennon's death, it's the most you can hope for is having a relative state of peace between nation states. I mean, when the Cold War ended, that was very optimistic. It was said history was over, but what happened? You still had brutal civil wars break out. And it, it's a very, very gloomy thing to think about, but... um. I just don't think that pacifism, with the best will in the world, even if um, let's say a lot more people became pacifists, when someone is so brainwashed by religious fanaticism, where they genuinely, genuinely believe in their head that they will go to heaven with 72 virgins if they kill so many infidels, then, you know, talking about the merits of pacifism, it, it's... It really is totally elusive for that sort of mindset. Anyway, um, that's just my thoughts. You can agree or disagree, but I'll put a link to the to the bed in video. It's very interesting. Um, just to be clear, I don't um, I don't laugh at pacifists. That's not my position. Some people do. Some people. You know, see them as silly hippies. I, I think there's sincerely held beliefs. I understand them and I respect that. But I also think there's many flaws with the argument. And it's actually insulting, not just reckless, but insulting to say to someone who, let's say, has a home invader, that they should just... I mean, obviously, it's practical situations. If, if they're stealing something and they just want... You know, they're armed and you're not, then it's practical to maybe just let them go. But if you are in a position to defend yourself, I say, hell yeah. Hell yeah. 
especially if you have a young family um, or you have loved ones. I mean, there is a real um, moral issue there, especially for men. You know, what what man would allow someone to rape his wife or girlfriend without doing something about it? Where does the pacifist argument tie in with that? Uh, of course, feminists would say, okay, teach her to protect herself, but that isn't always realistic. Anyway, just some things to think about. Check out the video, it is interesting viewing.